Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. upon you in a thousand generations in your family your children and the children the children may his presence go before you and behind you beside you all around you behind you he is with you he's with you in the morning the evening in the coming you're going and you're weeping rejoicing he is for you he's for you he is for you he's 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 for you he is for you amen direct our attention to God's Word in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20 will be our word under examination for today. And we'll be in the first four verses, chapter 20. And a sermon that I've entitled, The Lord Has Won the Battle. The Lord Has Won the Battle. As you know, I mentioned last week at the very beginning of the service that it has been one of those weeks. And it must have been a continuation from last week to this week. <laughs> it's been one of those weeks. And I got thinking to myself, you know, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Lord, what are you trying to show me? Do I need to have more patience? Are you preparing for something? And I had this thought that it should be on our radar. We should be aware when it seems as if the devil is on the offensive that we must have kicked some dirt in his face. When you can, when you can stir the baptismal waters and two that have Name the name of Jesus, be baptized. When you can start the process, if you will, if you want to call it process, 
the biblical act of discipleship. You start using those words in the local congregation. When you start making disciples of Jesus, when you start equipping the church, the enemy doesn't like that. Now, I know that this is all the work of the Lord, and we can say we kick some dirt in the devil's face, but that's really beside the point because the Lord is doing the work. God is, God is doing the work, and God is up to something in his people. Do you believe that? God is up to something in and among his people, and, and I want to be part of it. I don't want to sit on the sidelines when the battle is raging. Hey, I don't want to be on the sidelines. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to be absent. I don't want to be absent when God is, is doing a good work. And I, and I had this thought coming from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. You know this verse. Hopefully you do. It says, be sober-minded. Our enemy is the devil, the adversary, the devil. Be sober-minded. Be stable-minded. Have the mind of Christ that is unshakable, where nothing will shake your faith. Be watchful. Be on the lookout. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So, what do we say about it? When things in life seem as if they are stacking up, be sober-minded. Lord is working amongst his people, be watchful, be sober-minded. When the mission of God becomes the mode of operation for God's people, when God's people become missional-minded, be sober-minded. For the devil is on the prowl. The book of Job calls the devil the Satan or the deceiver. But here is the reassuring promise that we have, the beautiful promise in God's Word. You know from Genesis to the book of Revelation, there is a bedrock truth that God will never leave us nor forsake us. From the book of Genesis all the way to the book of the Revelation. When God walked with, with, with Adam and Eve, our first parents, in the garden in the cool of the day, God was with them. All the way through the book of the Revelation when it says that God will be their God and we will be his people. We have this reassuring promise that we have victory in Jesus. We sang we sang this song. Jared Longshore in his upcoming book that is entitled Wisdom for Kings and Queens states this of the battle before us. He says, God's people must get wisdom to build and fight well in the day of adversity. You need wisdom if you're going to build and if you're going to fight. I, I like that song, we're on the battlefield for our Lord. Yeah, we're on the battlefield for our Lord. But who do we fight? Well, the Bible says, according to the, verses that, the verse I read in James, it is the enemy, the devil. And he has an ally called the flesh. As if, as, as if the devil and your flesh have signed a contract against your very, your very life and your livelihood hid in Christ. The devil knows that he is a defeated foe and will do everything to ruin your testimony. He will do everything that he can to steal your joy. But we are promised in many places in Scripture, that through the resurrected Jesus we have victory. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, which is considered a Corinthian creed, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 says, O oh death, where is your victory? Where is it? Nowhere. O oh death, where is your sting? Can't be found. Why? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a hope that is unshakable, and our hope is in the resurrected Jesus. When your cars break down, when your AC goes on the front, Fritz, when you got people in the hospital, when you got people in your family who is sick, we have hope in the resurrected Jesus. I hope you know that. So I'll ask you if you will, let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We'll be looking at the first four verses in Deuteronomy. 
Again, the sermon is entitled, if I had to put a title to it, would be, The Lord Has Won the Battle. The Lord Who Has Won the Battle. So, verse 1. The Bible says, When you go out to war against your enemies, and you see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle... The priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. Why? For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Father, we just pray right now that you would add your blessing to the reading of this word so that we would hear what you say to your church. Father, for the one here who is brokenhearted, we pray that you would mend that broken heart. For the one that is on the very edge of adversity and hardship, Father, we pray that the resurrected Jesus will be their hope and peace. For the one who doesn't know you today, we pray that salvation will, they will inherit in salvation by the time we leave today, Lord, according to your will and your grace. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now up until this point in the book of Deuteronomy, the people have been issued reminders over civil and ceremonial laws, and how to live in peace and unity and shalom with their um, with, their, with their people, with their neighbor, how to love their neighbor, how to love God with all their heart and how to love their neighbor. So there has been uh, a reminders over the civil laws and ceremonial laws and, and, and what you do if there's some, some land that is in dispute. What, what do you do if there's some manslaughter issues that come up? And what, what do you do? How do you tend to these matters? And so there is a reiteration of these civil laws and ceremonial laws and, and the commandments that the Lord give to his people. There's a reminder of how they must conduct themselves as they enter into the promised land. And so all these things are, are, are uh, commandments before they even step foot into the, the, the promised land. Out, outside of the sheer detail of the law, and sometimes, have you ever been bogged down as it fails as you, as you maybe have read the book of Leviticus or, or uh, Deuteronomy or something like that, you've read it. Have you ever felt bogged down and saying, there's a lot of, there's a lot of laws that, that seem to be here. There's, there's a lot of things that, that are here that the Lord prescribes to Israel, but maybe not for, for the church. May, may, may I remind you of a simple fact? As we said at the very beginning of this, we said, yes, this is God's word too. The book of Deuteronomy, the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, Exodus, Genesis, so forth, and so on. The whole canon of Scripture is God's, is God's word. But outside the sheer detail of the law, we are reminded that the God of the universe, the God of the cosmos, the God that created you, the God that created the stars by His fingers, the, the, the Lord who created and put breath in you is the same God who is a God of order and expects nothing but perfection. But praise be to God, He's merciful too. He's merciful and He is gracious as He is perfectly holy. The Lord describes for His people that they are to be well prepared before they go into battle. And the same can be said for you and I. This these first four verses are heavy with application for the church. They are heavy for you and I as we prepare every single day of our life to go into a world that absolutely hates the name of Jesus. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but every time you step in the public square, there are people, maybe not be so many people around you depending on where you're at, but there is always either through ideas or through the people, there is people who hates the name of Jesus. Because there is a demand that one must trust Christ and Christ alone as the avenue of salvation. As there is no other name under heaven which men might be saved through the name of Jesus. That is what the world hates. 
That is what the world hates. And every time we step out into public, every time we go and we mingle with, uh, with people in public, in the world, we are rubbing elbows, no doubt, with people and ideas that are antagonistic to the gospel. There are things in life that will attempt to pull you in every direction through the things that we hear, the things that we read, the things that we, we see. And in fact, the enemy might throw a landmine at you or a bomb every now and then to distract you that we have victory in Jesus. There might be things that stack upon one another week by week. It seems like month on month there's things that are coming against me. And Lord, what are you doing the enemy will throw everything he can to distract you that you have been bought by the blood of Jesus. And one day he's returning and one day we're going to go and we're going to be in the presence of Jesus for all eternity to worship him. But until then, we have to be in this world. We have to function in this world. We have to love Jesus with all of our heart and we must worship him with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, spirit and everything that we have. Yes, the enemy is going to come against you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because the Lord might bring you to a battle. The Lord might bring you at the very crossroad of a battle. Number one, to mold you, to shape you, to see where your allegiance will lie, to see what, you're, to see what you will do in and through this battle, to see if you'll rely on Him to make it through. To see whether or not you're going to be a woe is me God. Why did you allow this to happen to me? Or whether you're going to hold to the old rugged cross and trust that Jesus has won the victory. Are you going to do that? Or are we going to whine and complain and say, oh God, why? There are things in life and struggles that we need to face head on. See, here's the thing. A person who... A person who is where they need to be in their walk with the Lord, they will not simply just sweep things and matters under the rug. Face it head on. The mature in Christ, they will understand. See, I want to be mature in Christ. I might not be there where I want to be yet. I don't want to be mature in Jesus. We must understand that there is a battle in front of us. Always somewhere at some time. And the Lord wants us, number one, to rely on Him to make it through. Look at verse 1. It says, when you go out against war against your enemies, you're going to see some things. You're going to see some horses. You're going to see some chariots. You're going to see this army that will outnumber you. And your first reaction, will, you'll, you'll be in fear. But he says, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord God is with you. He brought you out of Egypt. That's almost like the tag for all of Israel's history. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's almost like God is tapping them on the shoulder, reminding them of his faithfulness, that he brought them out. It's almost like, hey, never forget Egypt. Never forget Egypt. Never forget God's faithfulness. Never forget that God fed you in the wilderness. He gave you manna from heaven. He gave you quail at one point until it come out your nostrils. He gave you water from a rock. God supplied. He guided you in the daytime and in the nighttime. He has been with you. He has been ever faithful. Now, Hebrews, when you go to battle, God's people, when you go to battle, the Canaanites will seem to have outnumbered you. When you go against the Canaanites, when you go against their idols... The Lord is your champion. Now, if you fast forward in Israel's history, you'll find in the book of Joshua, when we actually step foot into the promised land, this becomes a reality. This, this becomes realized. Now, up till then, this is, this is prophetic in a way. And so, the Lord is telling them, these are prophetic things through the mouth of the priest. He's telling them these words. But if you were to fast forward in Israel's history, you'll find these horses in battle. In fact, Joshua chapter 17, verse 16, it says this. Uh, about the Canaanites. It says, the people uh, of Joseph said this, the hill country is not enough for us. Yet, all the Canaanites who dwell in the plains, they have chariots of iron. They have chariots of iron. Both those in Bathsheen and the villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. So, they have these chariots that are pulled by horses. They are many in number. In other words, in other words, God is saying, do not be discouraged. Do not be frightened by what you see. Do not be frightened by the circumstances in front of you. Yes, 
it seems as if things have stacked up over the, over the days. But I know that God will see us through. I know that God will provide a way, as He always has with His people. Remember, your God is with you. The one who brought you out of Egypt. The one who moved mightily there and will move mightily here. What would we underscore with this simple saying, remember I brought you out of Egypt? What would we underscore? We would underscore have faith. Have faith. That might be part of our problem. Because a lot of us, we probably think that we are realists. I consider myself a realist, you know, hey. Logicians, you know, we, we, we put logic and reason high on our spectrum, yeah. Somewhere in there we must have faith. But logic and reason never supersedes faith. Never conquers faith. Maybe that's part of our, 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 our problem, is we forget to implore faith. Keep in mind, there is no question about it that we will go to war or battle in this walk, a spiritual battle. And the Bible reminds us that God is with us. In fact, verse 2 says, when you draw near to battle, the priest, who's the priest? The one who spoke the word of the Lord to the people. He will come near, he will come forward. And speak to the people. So what happened? God's word went forward. This is not the high priest. This is one that would be considered to be the anointed for war. This is the priest that was God's representative during this time of war. And how the people would prepare for worship of the Lord. Yes. Yes. In times of war, what were they instructed to do? Worship God. In times of trials and tribulations, what are we To do. Worship God. When we don't know how we're going to pay the rent next month, what do we do? We worship God. When our marriages are on the fritz, what do we do? We worship God. When our when it seems that our children are wayward, what do we do? We worship God. When there are things that are stacking up week by week, by day, by day, what do we do? We worship God and we give him thanksgiving. Just because the circumstances might be stacking up against us doesn't negate the fact that we, as God's people, through Christ Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit that has indwelt us, we must worship him. These Jewish writers approximate that this was a person appointed, a priest, during times of war, and this priest would sound the trumpet in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, and also we see it in Numbers 31, verse 6. And he had others that would come who would, who he had, it was, he was kind of over duty of these other, other priests who might come up, and they were to do the same thing. And, and they would say these words. They would, they would reiterate these words to the congregation, the priest and those that had, he had appointed to kind of follow suit. They said these words, Hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel. Today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart be faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. Do not fear them. And for the Lord your God, it is He who goes to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. Let me say this. I know that there are things in life that that are tough. Life is tough sometimes. But when you put that in the scale of eternity, it is barely a flash. It is barely a flash. This was given to Israel as an assurance that wherever they went, whoever they came up against, that the Lord would be with them. And He would be with them. He would lead them. He would guide them. But they they needed to be, they must be fully devoted to Him, fully devoted to the Lord, fully devoted to the commandments that the Lord has given, and there could not be any sin found in the camp. Any unconfessed, any unattended sin must be brought out of form. There must not be sin in the camp. That can be a whole sermon in and of itself. And our life, that is in Jesus Christ. Once we devote our life to Him and say, I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Till the day that I die, and when I die, 
by God's grace and mercy, I will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. But until then, until then, our life is full of battles. And I don't have to tell you, this is a new thing for you. This isn't a new concept. In fact, it's a reminder for you. But just as the Lord issued this decree to Israel, so he has for those in Jesus. Now, what I want to say here is, before I recap, or before I give an overview from verse 5 to the end, okay, very briefly, I'm going to do that here in a moment. Before we get to the knit and to the grit of the application of these verses, and, and there is some knit and some grit, if you will. This will be the proverbial where the rubber meets the road kind of application. Before we get to this application, I want to offer a bit of the overview. And even, even so, in the overview, right smack in the middle of this overview, there is some application that is strong for the, for the body of Christ that they need, need to hear today. So, with this in mind, here is what we see from verses 5 until the end of the chapter. I want to begin by looking at verse 5. The, off, the officers, they're going to dismiss anyone from the army who would meet this criteria. Now, mind you, they haven't gone into the promised land yet. So this would be in order to get into the promised land and to build their homes and their families. Okay, if you haven't had a chance to do that, once you got into the promised land, you would be dismissed for these things. Okay, so, so listen very carefully here. All right, so they would dismiss all of those who had planted a vineyard and had not had a chance to eat the fruit thereof yet. Okay, they would dismiss those who were engaged to a wife to be and had not brought her home yet. Okay, if they had not been able to establish the home, they would have been dismissed. Okay, all right, so verse 8. They are due to dismiss all who were timid and all who were faint hearted. Now, let me stop there for a moment. In today's service to King Jesus, I want you to hear me on this. It takes men and women with backbone and resolve. It takes some men and some women who have some thick skin, who don't get offended over every little thing in life. What in the world has happened to the church today when people are so afraid to step up and step out so they just stay away? Who said serving Jesus would be a bed of roses? Who said it was going to be a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? What happened to the days when people had thick skin and could roll with the punches today? No, Today we get offended by the drop of the hat. The body of Christ desperately needs some tough men and tough women who do not mind getting in the trenches of ministry. See, here's the thing. Maybe if we spent more time in God's Word, reading God's more, Word more than we do everyone else's business, we might not be so easily offended. No, the city will be attacked to the conditions of peace had been proclaimed. If the place was to be a place of great peace, so be it, it would be annexed. If not, they would be taken. All the males would be put to sword. The women and the children and the cattle were taken as swag of war. In verse 10 through 15, we see this. And for those of the Canaanites, nothing would be saved. People talk about the seemingly ruthlessness of God in the Old Testament. How could God command whole people groups to be killed? Well, number one, God is sovereign. God knows the future. And, and number two, this is 2022. Th this isn't the ancient Near Eastern culture that we live in. So we say, why would God command such a thing? And if we were students of God's Word and all we would have to do was read a little bit in God's Word and we find the answer. Verse 18 is the answer. It says that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable or detestable practices that they have done for their gods and so you sin against the Lord your God. Not to mention that the Canaanite people would rise up and come to murder them Thus, 
threatening the livelihood and the uh, likelihood of Messiah being born. In sieging of the city, no trees will be cut down, only those that did not bear fruit. Now, that's a sermon in and of itself, too. Now, these are rules of warfare given to Israel by the Lord God. Yes, there were some rules of engagement. But I want to return, as I mentioned, to the knit and the grit of this application. Return to the matter of the application at hand. Before I close, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, be careful how we answer. Is the gospel worth standing up for? Is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, is it worth proclaiming? Any child of God who's mature in their faith would say, yes, absolutely, both of those. Then why do we have a catalog of excuses not to serve Him? The life that we live as a follower of Jesus is at times, it is warfare. Yes, it's, it's tough sometimes. And the number of those antagonists that are hateful to the cause of Christ, they're antagonistic to the gospel and the cause of Christ, they are legion. But we know that Jesus is the victor. He's won the day. The number of those who hate Christ are legion. The many tools of mass destruction they have at their disposal. But we have the risen Jesus. In times of war, Jesus is calling all faithful and sober-minded, stable-minded men to the front lines. He's calling you men to the front line. We need good leaders. We need good teachers. We need good soldiers. We need good servers. Listen, you need to go head to head, toe to toe with your unbelieving friends over the gospel. You need to go toe to toe with that agnostic professor that your son or daughter has taken a college class under. Because if you don't teach him or her, they certainly will. The time of sitting on the sidelines are long past gone. We need soldiers who are conscious of the fight. They know that there is a fight around them, that the enemy is struggling for the minds and heart of our children. We know that there is a fight around us. We need soldiers who, are, who know that there is a fight, who do not put their head in the sand, who will not bury their sand and become oblivious to the war around us. Who in their right mind, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Operation Desert Storm, whatever battle it might be, whoever, I mean, who in their right mind in the history of history, as they were looking at their maps to strategize for war, whoever said in their right mind, well, it'll work itself out. No one. Preparation must be an undertaking of everyone that names the name of Jesus. We need some men who will step up and serve Piney Grove Baptist Church as they are serving Jesus and say, send me, send me. Men who will once and for all shed this false humility of I'll just serve in the background. Now, that's good to serve in the background, but Jesus needs you on the front line. See, serving on the front line and serving in humility can go hand in hand. This false humility and, 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 to, sh and to shed this idea, we'll just serve back here. Sometimes that's an excuse to not serve at all. We need men who will lift the banner of Jesus on the battlefield that is ruthless and raging around us all the time. If not, listen, if not, your family is in danger of the enemy, your testimony is at danger of the enemy, 
Your church is at danger of the enemy. And your personal walk with Jesus is in danger. Now, I'm not saying... And I'm not glorifying the enemy. I'm not glorifying Jesus. I'm saying, I'm saying this. If we will march in the name of Jesus with the gospel of our, as our marching orders, the Lord Jesus will be with us as we face our enemies. And you never know. You never know. The Lord might win some of those enemies to his side. He might win some to his side. I've heard people say, are you a soul winner? No. Are you a soul winner? No. I've, I've, heard, I've grown up in the church that said, are you a soul winner? No, you're not. You're not a soul winner. The only one who is a soul winner is the Lord Jesus. Now, you might proclaim the good news. That might be your marching orders, and it is. The only one who has ever won a soul is the Lord Jesus himself. So, that's our marching orders. That is our marching orders, and he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. He gives us courage to stand. He gives us courage to witness. He gives us courage to teach, to proclaim, and to share the love of Jesus with your lost friends and family members and people that you come in contact with. He's with you just like he said he would be. He said he would never leave you, never forsake you, Not merely is he a commander that tells us to go, but he goes with us. He is not just a general who strategizes for war and lets the soldiers go out. No, he goes with you in the greatest of dangers. He's not just an observer that observes on high and and looks on his computer monitors or whatever at the battle itself. No, he goes to fight with you and for you with the determination to save you. And the Lord Jesus, he will not fail you. He will not forsake you. And by the way, the greatest battle that ever happened haven't happened on a, on a hill. And they talk about marching on a hill. The greatest, the greatest battle to ever take place was on a hill called Mount Calvary where Jesus was nailed to the cross and he won the victory when he folded the grave clothes and marched out of the grave We have something, we have someone to go to battle for and who will not abandon us when we're in the heat of battle. And how are we equipped for this battle, you might say? Well, number one, you must be born again. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again before you can even get into the battle. Secondly, we are equipped for battle by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, we are empowered by the battle by the word of God. That is our sword. That is our sword. The word of God. It's a sword, by the way, and not a hammer. Okay? You don't use the sword like a hammer to beat down people. You want more courage to stand for Jesus? It's simple. Okay. Close on this, I promise. You want more courage to stand for Jesus? You know what you do? You ask him. You want more wisdom? How to answer your skeptical friends? You ask him. That wisdom, James says, you ask, he'll give it to you. You want to trust in Jesus today to forgive you of your sins? And then you get on the battlefield for the Lord? You ask him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Even in the thick of the battle. I love these verses. I'm going to close on these verses. Think about them. Think about how you might be able to step onto the battlefield for the Lord. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody. Will it be tribulation? Will it be distress? Will it be persecution? Will it be famine? Will it be nakedness? Will it be danger or sword? No. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm convinced. I am sober-minded in this. I am unshaken. 
that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in your life, adversity or otherwise, will separate you from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together.